Good morning and welcome to the First Congregational Church of Essex. We wish that there were more of you in person here this morning, uh, but we thank you for adhering to our COVID protocols. Um, we also will be streaming this live, at, or sorry, not live, but we'll be streaming it again at two o'clock this afternoon. So if you miss this service or if someone you know misses this service and would like to see it, uh, it will be running again at two o'clock. I wanted to start this morning uh, with some scripture readings, and the first scripture for this morning comes from the book of Proverbs. This comes from chapter 29, and it is only verse 18. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, 
but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. The second scripture from the re- this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, and it is chapter 49, just verses 22 and 23. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples, and they will bring me your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Kings will be foster fathers and their queens, your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet, and then you will know that I am Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. The next scripture reading for this morning comes from 1 Corinthians, and it is chapter 12, verses 4 through 14. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, and to another, speaking in different tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one in the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Just as a body, though, one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. So it is with the body of Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. And the final scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Hebrews It is chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And that ends the scripture reading for this morning. So this morning, I wanted to talk a little bit about our past. Some of us, as, sorry, some of us are or were, as the case may be, Roman Catholic by birth, or Lutheran, or Methodist, or Presbyterian. Some of us were actually raised as Congregationalists, myself included, but on average, the U- for the UCC, that would only be true for about one quarter of the friends and members of this congregation. Some people maintain that we live in a post-denominational world, and this church is living proof of that thesis. But as we gather here in community, whether it's in person or over Zoom, I think it's important for us to look carefully and critically at what our heritage is in the congregational church. What brings us all here this morning? Who are we? What do we believe? And how do those beliefs shape our lives? Now, the Congregational Church was formed from two basic streams of immigrants, the Pilgrims and the Puritans, who came to this country from England in the 17th century to flee from persecution and in search of religious freedom. The Puritans were, by and large, business and community leaders in their native England, more aristocratic, if you will, than the Pilgrims. They came also for the promise of economic gain in this new world. 
From the pilgrims, we claim the proud heritage of a commitment to Luther's priesthood of all believers. With this Bible that we always have open in our church, each and every one of us claims equal access to God's word. I might interpret the word of the Bible on a Sunday morning, but I have no right to claim that my understanding is any higher, comes from a higher authority than anyone else's. As Congregationalists, we claim the precious right to interpret the Bible for ourselves, each of us as individuals, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And truth, we recognize, resides not just within the bound pages of our holy book, but rather where the words of scripture rest within our hearts and souls. Our moral compass is fashioned in the depths of our own beings. Now in the past, we have called this precious gift from the pilgrims a liberty of soul. From the Puritans, though, we claim the proud her heritage of a nation fashioned as a city upon a hill, with the eyes of the world upon us. The Puritans saw it as their divine mandate to establish a new world where the laws of men were to be shaped by the laws of God. In the words of our scripture lesson from Hebrews, they came looking for a better country, a heavenly one. These are the words of John Winthrop, first governor of the colony of Massachusetts, as they sailed towards the new world, and I'm quoting. The only way to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together as one person, we must abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the sake of others' necessities. We must make others' conditions our own, having before our eyes our commission as members of the same body. For we shall be as a city set on a hill, and the eyes of the world will be upon us. In parables, this morning we read these words, without a vision, the people perish. The founding vision of the Puritans was a noble vision, a beautific and a beautiful vision upon which they sought to build their body politic. Now I've raised the subject of our congregational heritage for two important reasons. First, looking back on our history surely helps us to understand who we are today. But the other important reason for opening this topic um, is that we have all just finished a fairly divisive fall and a caustic election season. Allusions to faith and religion and morality, they always permeate our political discourse. And had there been road signs around us in the lead up to the fall, they would have said, exercise extreme caution ahead. But now that that fall election season is over, I believe it's worth our time not only to engage in the age old dialogue about church and state, but also to think critically about where each of us fits into the wider spectrum of belief and what that means. Several years ago when the first democratic voting took place in South Africa officially ending apartheid, the newly elected Nelson Mandela read a poem by Marion Williamson. My favorite part of that poem is this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabuli fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And it is important that we proudly display the glory of God that is in each and every one of us. But for this morning, I'd like to change that line, because I'd also like to proudly make manifest the story that we share as congregationalists. When we gather here on a Sunday morning, we do so by the grace of all those who came before us and all those who have yet to come. The history we share means that our story started well before each of us was born and will continue long after each of us is gone. And understanding that story and where we sit within it 
helps us to understand who we are. So for now, back to our shared history. The, pil so the pilgrims and the Puritans understood religious persecution. The monarchies in England were, some of them, aligned with the Holy Roman Catholic Church, while others broke away from Rome, favoring the formation of the Anglican Church, over which the monarch could have more control. And the monarch usually enforced observance of his religious preference at any and all cost. The results were sometimes devastating and bloody and brutal. And so I find it fascinating but also heartwarming that the Puritans came here committed to forming a civil society that was to be structured carefully and systematically upon their religious ideals. From their own tormented history, they respected the necessity and wisdom of separation of church and state. The church was not to serve at the whim of the governor. Neither was the governor to be dictated by the authorities of the church. But they also understood that the moral compass each of us carries within us should guide the formation of a government based on justice and mercy and humility. And to bring these two strains of immigrant wisdom down to the most individualistic of terms, speaking as a congregationalist, the Puritan in me wants my government to uphold the highest of my religious beliefs. But the pilgrim soul in me wants to be sure that the government does not fashion or dictate my moral compass. In truth, it did not take very long for the Puritans to begin to fail in their noble vision. Without a generation of their founding, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had become a theocracy, and the dark chapter of persecution and exile of its citizens had begun. Far from making others' conditions their own, they imposed their conditions on everyone else. They taxed all citizens of the colony for support of the Congregational Church. Now, admittedly, this is an idea that might sometimes seem tempting to some of our boards of stewardship. But those who founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who were at first humbled by the dangers of the union of state and church, moved slowly and precipitously toward that which they said they had most feared. They moved steadily towards a literal manifestation of the passage we read this morning from Isaiah, which says that the state must be a nursing mother to the church. Quote, kings and queens shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And they shall know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be abandoned that wait for me. Roger Williams, founder of our neighboring state of Rhode Island, was one of the first of the founding Puritans who saw the road signs of danger for the early colony as it transmuted from noble vision to periled practice. Williams was accused of various transgressions in regards to the public practice of prayer, one of which was that he prayed with his wife and daughter who were deemed to be unrenegates, whatever that means. The state, in a court proceeding presided over by none other than John Winthrop himself, sought to declare Roger Williams unfit for citizenship. And in his own defense, William cited that passage that we just read from Isaiah and exhorted the early Puritans to refrain from seeing government as a nursing mother to the church. Williams, knowing that he was about to be deported to England, fled into the wild, into the snow-covered northern Rhode Island. He fled because of the words of biographer John Barry. His life experience had made him conscious of both the power of the state and the state's willingness to use power, even when it was in error. And during that long, hard winter of isolation, Williams was befriended, indeed was kept alive by some of the Native Americans. In other words, the land upon which Providence was founded was tilled by the tools in compassion, of compassion and understanding and mutual accord, by the making of another's conditions our own. Williams had formed a brotherhood or a commonwealth founded truly on the essence of the gospel. Roger Williams, in defiance of the authority of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, stepped with courage onto new ground, and he began a journey that would lead his nation towards religious pluralism. 
He began a journey that clarified the separation of state and church, but maintained the union of Christian consciousness and citizenship. He affirmed that liberty of soul, which is central to the congregational heritage. And in a beautiful letter written to the fathers of the town of Providence upon the adoption of their constitution, Williams wrote these words. There goes many a ship to sea with hundred souls in one ship, whose weal and woe is common and is a true picture of the commonwealth, or a human society. Papists and Protestants, Jews and Turks may be embarked on one ship, upon which I affirm all liberty of conscience, such that none be forced to come to the ship's prayers of worship, nor compelled from their own particular prayers or worship if they practice any. The commander of this ship ought to command the ship's course and also command that justice, peace, and sobriety be kept and practiced. So I like to claim Roger Williams as one of our heroes in our congregational heritage, one of the heroes who shed light upon the inclusivity and interfaith affirmation and liberty of soul which has been essential to this particular congregational church. He stands alongside John Robinson, who reminded us that there is always more truth and light to break forth from God's holy word. And alongside John Winthrop, whose vision was of a commonwealth where we make others' conditions our own, and we seek to be that city on a hill. But being a congregationalist in a civil society is both a privilege and a responsibility. Our heritage requires of us that we seek to entertain one another in brotherly affection and make others' conditions our own, and that we carry those truths with us always. It requires of us that we respect one another's freedom of soul, and that we remember that no one holds the template for another's moral compass. It asks of us that, we can, that if we consider from the depths of our own moral compass questions like these, what does it mean to make another's conditions our own? How responsible are we for one another? And how do we engage our moral compass not only in the issues that are dragged out into the limelight by something like political elections, but also just into the issues that we face on a daily basis? A few years ago on one of my mission trips in Deep River, this was brought up directly by one of my teenagers. One of our teenagers found himself face to face with an adult leader from another church who was making um, negative comments about Islam. And I don't need to tell you what the leader said for the story, but I will tell you how our teenager responded. And now I'm quoting because at the time I was impressed enough to write it down in my journal. He said, I believe it is a fundamental right for all of us to worship however, whenever, and wherever we want. And that includes Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, or anyone else. And although I personally do not follow the dictates of Islam, I will fight tooth and nail to allow others to do so. It is not my right to tell anyone else what to believe, period. Those words could have been taken directly from Roger Williams. And lest any of you thinking in the pews or at your homes today thinks the living, breathing church of today does not connect to our history, that teenager is living proof that it does. Because we were and are and forever shall be the people who stand up and proudly proclaim that we will not use our Bible to bully. We will not use our book to judge or condemn or lessen the humanity of any child of God. We will use our Bible to inform our own spirits every day, knowing that truth and light continues to break forth all the time in different ways to different people. And I will conclude with these words of Roger Williams. Having bought truth dear, we must not sell it cheap, nor the least grain of it for the whole world, nor the saving of souls, though our own is most precious. 
So the question for us this morning is this, will we continue to work towards making manifest the story we share as Congregationalists, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, in our homes and in our communities? Will we do our best to live in that ideal of a city set on a hill, even when it's not easy? Will we allow this rich heritage to inform the way we live our lives? Will we choose to make manifest the story we share, to live and breathe it, and allow it to call us forward as we love one another and grow our faith together? Lord, listen to your children pray. Thank you for all the beautiful celebrations of this last month. Thank you, Lord, for the love in our families, for the support in our communities, and the faith that we all seek to deepen and share. And as we continue through this cold season, Lord, help us to remember those who need more love and support and understanding. Help us to provide for them what you so graciously provide for us. Help us to be that city set on a hill by loving and caring for one another as you would have us do. Amen.